So an overview of what we're going to look at today um, is contamination and sources of contamination. Uh, environmental samples, just kind of give a quick overview of that. Uh, different sampling applications, methods, and considerations that we would, would implement for our soil and sediment sampling uh, procedures. So in general, when we talk about environmental contamination, we're referring to anything that might be potentially harmful, uh, potentially harmful chemicals that are introduced into an environment. Uh, now this can impact your air, your water, uh, your soil or ground surfaces, and that can have more far reaching effects on, on humans, uh, animals, and then aquatic and plant life. So definitely something that you know is a concern if you, if you are dealing with some contaminants at, at a site or anywhere in the environment how it can, can just snowball and, and affect different things. Uh, so, so if you can uh, kind of control that at its source, if, if you do have a, a contamination source, control at the source, um, you can limit a lot of different impacts that could have uh, down the line. Some common contaminants that we look at often in, in the environmental world, um, obvious ones like your petroleum and chemicals. Um, a lot of times with analysis, we'll do what's called volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds. Those are the target compounds that you typically see in your petroleum products or um, different chemical products. Uh, so, so those are often analyzed in, 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 in a lot of different contaminated sites. You also have polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, man-made chemicals that, that have been uh, introduced into the environment through, through different contamination sources over, over the years. Currently, um, you know, those were banned um, back in the late 1970s. So not something that we have continuing into the environment, but there is a lot of uh, legacy sites and a lot of uh, different areas where we still have PCBs that we're dealing with, uh, building materials, transformers, electrical equipment. Uh, so there is still that, that source there um, uh, that could present a contamination issue. Pesticides and herbicides. Uh, obviously, anything used to kill something else is going to be is going to be pretty toxic. So, uh, you know, use your pesticides, herbicides to control weeds, um, different things like that. But it's going to have some 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 effects on on other things, unintentional effects that you want to uh, be aware of there. Metals, asbestos, and, and another one that's uh, you know an emerging contaminant, the the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances (PFAS). Uh, you may have heard of those. Uh, typical things you see with nonstick or uh, water repellent type products. Uh, also, fire, firefighting foams and solutions. Um, those really haven't, uh, you know, in the 2000s is, is when we've been really looking at those and seeing what effects they may have on, on the environment and trying to research that so we can establish some regulation standards. Currently, no regulations or standards on that with the soil and sediment. But there are guidelines that have been introduced in recent years uh, that, that we have been working with. Um, so again, you know, something that's an emerging contaminant. And, and as you could imagine, there, there may be some others, you know, in the future that, that, that spring up. So, uh, you know, this is a, you know, a list that we kind of look at commonly now, but, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, there may be a few others that get added to this list. So when we look at, when we have contamination, you know, you could have contamination at pr practically anywhere. You know, you could be at an undeveloped site where you have some equipment still, you know, a potential for getting into the surface water, groundwater, the soil there. Um, but there are obviously some, some um, types of facilities that are a little bit more of an inherent risk for that, that type of contamination. Um, as you could uh, imagine here, um, automotive equipment maintenance type type facilities, those are going to be handling a lot of fuel petroleum product. Uh, so a higher potential for, for spills. Underground, above ground storage tanks, whether it be petroleum or chemical products, uh, you have an inherent risk of spills there, especially with your underground tanks. You don't really, you know, unless you've got a good double walled, you know, secondary containment type system underground, you don't know what's going on there um, until you do uncover it and find out you have a, a Pretty nasty issue there. So uh, definitely tanks are, are, are a concern that, that you want to be aware of with contamination sources. Fuel pumps, gasoline stations where they have, have their fuel pumps, you have the piping from the tanks to the pumps, often underground. Um, so there's definitely the risk there of contamination underground. Hydraulic lifts, uh, oil water separators, dry wells, transformers, 
um, you know, the, the oil containing transformers, especially the older ones that may still have the PCBs in them. Uh, some of that, you know, a lot of that equipment still is, is in use um, and, and are still operating today. They may change the oil out, but you still have that, that potential for um, contamination for PCB there. Some more sources, coal ash, tar, your, your manufactured gas plants. Uh, you see a lot of those cleanups going on. So, you know, some coal tars and things like that, that, that might be a concern there. Industrial manufacturing facilities, a lot of different operations that go on in industrial sites that could, that could contaminate uh, you know, the environment, um, but also process waste or, or wastewater. Um, you know, they, may, they manage a lot of process waste and wastewater, and if that's not managed properly or, or leaks out, um, could cause contaminated area. Railroads, um, you know, you got your pressure treated uh, railroad ties, creosote, uh, things like that that can leach into the, the environment. Um, treated wood, uh, you get a lot of treated wood that that's going to have a chemical, you know, anything that's, you know, last a long time in, in, in a wet environment and it's treated with something, uh, chances are that that it's got to have some sort of chemical or contaminant that, that might leach into the area. So, um, you know, you need these things to, to last a long time and such to serve its proper function, but you do have to look at the after effects there. Uh, with treated wood, you might have chromium, copper, arsenic, that, that could be a concern. Debris or buried waste uh, back in, you know, way back before there's strict regulations and, and rules on landfill practices. Uh, a lot of uh, communities, towns, villages, cities, counties and whatnot, they would operate their own landfill um, with, with different varying practices. So, um, you know, sometimes it was as simple as digging a hole and putting, putting all the waste in it. Um, you know, obviously there's some, some after effects there. Things will leach into the groundwater contaminate down gradient sources and, and all that. So um, you see a big push sometimes with, you know, those old buried um, inactive landfill sites that, that may have, uh, you know, higher groundwater tables and might affect surrounding sites. So there, there's a push to get those cleaned up and taken care of and uh, either relocate to, to a regulated permitted facility or, or possibly um, putting in controls and such to, uh, to uh, control right there at that site. And also historic site activities. Uh, you never know what, what's happened at a site. Um, if it's developed, it, it has a potential that there may have been some sort of uh, you know, risk for, for contaminated, contamination of some sort. So on sample matrix, what, what we mean by sample matrix is the actual what, the, the media that you're sampling, whether it be, you know, as, as we're talking here in today's presentation of soil, sediment material, but it could also be um, groundwater, surface water, you know, potable water source. Um, practically anything could be sampled. Um, you know, sometimes you might see, see like a, a like the Hudson River where there's some concern with the PCD contamination. They did a whole extensive, you know, they were sampling sediment, water, uh, soil, plants, fish, and all that. Just because of the magnitude of, of, of that widespread contamination, you want to see how it may have affected the local ecology and, and, and whatnot. So um, you're not going to obviously do all that sampling on every site, but there, there are certain scenarios where you want to look into sampling some things other than the, the rudimentary soil, sediment, groundwater. Um, most sites you're going to see, okay, if we have a small spill tank or, or, or something like that, okay, we're going to look at soil and, and, and sediment and such, and we may look at the groundwater if we encounter it, but we're not getting into, you know, you know, going extensive into debris or plants or fish or anything like that. Now, when you're looking at what you're sampling, what matrix you're sampling, the value of that sampling, is, it's highly dependent on, on the availability of regulations and standards that you can compare your data to. Um, it, it's highly dependent on having consistent sample collection methods and also established consistent laboratory analysis methods. If you do some, you know, there, you might do some sampling where there's no established um, protocol for it, um, you know, and then you got to take that data for what it's worth. Um, you know, what does that data mean? You don't have any standards to compare it to. So it makes it very difficult for you to determine what you should do with a site if, if you find certain levels of contaminant where there's, there's not established standards or protocol for it. 
So on the sampling side, when, we're, when we look at sampling soil and sediment, we're trying to get a representative sample of, of, of what we want uh, to, to sample. So basically uh, a representative sample is a, is a sample that will ac accurately reflect the characteristics of, of the whole. Um, now we might be looking at an entire site and try to get representative samples over an entire site. We might look at a soil stockpile and try to get a representative sample of that. But you have to define what you're sampling and you have to define how you're gonna collect a representative sample from that. There's two different, two primary types of samples you're gonna, you're gonna collect, one being a grab sample, um, and that is a selected sample representing one data point or location. So a handful of soil from the wall of an excavation, uh, you know, that would just be a grab. Um, whereas the composite is you're, you're, you're combining multiple of those grab samples into a single sample. Now there's benefits to both. Uh, a grab sample, um, you know, that's going to give you a, a point in time, a point in location right there. Um, so if you have a specific area of concern and you, you take a worst case scenario, uh, that'll give you a kind of worst case data. Whereas your composite sample, you know, it, it combines everything. So you may not be looking at your worst case uh, scenario, but you're getting a, a better idea of what the whole uh, area of where you sampled might might be represented by. Um, so, you know, that composite sample could serve to dilute out, you know, contaminants or could serve to, you know, give you a, a better representation of the area. So you have to kind of know how you're sampling, know why you're sampling, know what you're sampling for. So with that, that brings us to question number one. Please continue, Cheyenne. Okay, question number one, which of the following is an emerging contaminant? If you pick C, the PFAS, you are correct. All right, so when we're sampling, uh, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, you want to have some standards, you want to have some regulations that, that, that uh, dictate how, you, how you're gonna sample things, what you're gonna sample for, and what you're gonna compare your data to. Um, with, with here in New York State, we have several different things that we're looking at depending on what, um, what you're sampling for and how, why you're sampling. Uh, here's a list of, of some regulations that, that we do uh, work with routinely. Uh, first one there, the 6NYC RR Part 360. Uh, those are your solid waste regulations. There are um, some protocol in there as far as sampling fill type material um, relative to solid waste. Uh, and we'll go a little more in detail with, with these in some later slides. But um, as you look down through there, the, the second, third, and fourth bullets, those are uh, pertain to New York State DEC's remediation, uh, Division of Environmental Remediation. So um, how you investigate sites, how you remediate sites, what you uh, establish for criteria to make sure sites are remediated properly. Um, so, so that's in your commissioner policy, CP51. Uh, 6 NYCR Part 375 in your Division of Environmental Remediation DR10 document. Uh, an additional one for that emerging contaminant PFAS, there is a sample and analysis and assessment of PFAS under DC's Part 375 remedial program. So that's a guidance document that has been put out there to establish um, some, some consistent methods to sample and analyze um, different media for, for PFAS and how you interpret that data. And the TOGS, the Technical and Operation Guidance Series 5.1.9, that, that's for sediment sampling. We'll talk a little bit later about that. And then lastly, there are the 6 NYC RR Part 371.3. In that Part 370 series, that's all hazardous waste type um, uh, regulations. Uh, so what we're doing with, with that is we're sampling waste materials to determine whether it's gonna be characterized as a hazardous waste or non-hazardous waste. And that determines where it can go as, as final disposition. 
So the sampling applications for soil and sediment, um, we'll, we'll look at so, some options that we would do for soil reuse, um, sediment dredging, how you, how you dredge sediment material based on sample analysis criteria, waste characterization, spills, storage tanks, uh, investigations of areas of concern, historical contamination, and then also risk mitigation, especially prior to pro property tra transfers. So if you're looking to buy a property or a client looking to buy a property, you know, they want to know, you know, environmental risk, phase one environmental status assessment, maybe lead into that su subsurface investigation or other type of sampling, make sure that they're not buying a property or a problem that might have contamination. So with soil reuse, going back to that 6 NYCR part 360, those solid waste um, regulations, there is, there is some criteria that's established in that uh, regulatory standard. So in general, when you look at um, a developed site, especially an urban area or industrial type developed site, commercial type property, um, you may have had some historical uh, indicators of, of, of contamination there or development that raises a red flag that might have led to contamination. So with those types of sites, if you're, if you're wanting to remove soil from that site and reuse it somewhere else, it's very critical to make sure that that soil um, isn't contaminated. You don't want to create a scenario where you're bringing contaminated soil from one site onto another that that may or may not have been previously contaminated. Because then you get in a situation where now we've got two contaminants, right? And not only are, might you have issues with cleaning up one site, now you got a second site. So if you do sample analysis beforehand and you see that there is contaminants there, then you can say, okay, we can't reuse this at a different site. We got to go landfill it. Or it comes back as clear of the standards, everything looks good, and we can confidently reuse that on another site without having any concerns about um, future litigation or issues with contaminating that other site. Um, and there are, if you look at the standards, there are some differences with with fill material that you're you're dealing with New York City area versus outside New York City area. Um, you know, and and with that, you know, there is a history of, of some sites in New York City that, ha that had a lot of these issues. So a little more stringent on some of the things that, that, that goes on in the New York City area. So here's some excerpts right out of that part 360 standard. Um, and as up here on the top left, you can see there are um, some sampling criteria based on, on your fill material quantity. So this is very useful to establish, again, consistent methods you know this is the minimum so you can you can do more but this is the minimum that, that you would be required to do to qualify that material as as um as for the reuse parameters and those reuse parameters under part 360 is right down here in the, the bottom right um there's three different criteria that they have general fill restricted use fill and limited use fill so depending on where your your, your values and your data um results are for the different contaminants that you analyze for, um, this will tell you what you can reuse it. Now it's important to note that if you've got soil that you know meets conditions for requiring the sampling, you, th there is no such thing as being able to use it for whatever you want. Um, what they want to avoid, um, you know, even though you might show that the contaminants are below standards, they don't want you taking the soil that might have contaminants in it. Um, to like a residential use or an agricultural use. Uh, this material would, would be more so in, in, in a setting that you can use as fill um, at, at a commercial property or industrial type site. And, and the fill that you can use, um, so your general fill, you can, any setting where fill material meets engineering criteria, except again, that undeveloped land or agricultural cropland. And then you, you go on down the line, restricted use, you can, use similar to that, but it has to be a place above the seasonal high water table. Uh, and then getting into the limited use fill, um, you're, you're basically using it on your foundations or pavements above the seasonal high water table. Uh, I'm continuing on with soil reuse, going to the DER 10, um, the part 375 type criteria. There's also things there and, and these are more so with your remediation sites, anything that's under New York State DC remedial program, 
Um, there's different parameters than what you would do for the part 360. Uh, uh, bottom right, similar, to, uh, similar table here um, for your sampling criteria based on your, your quantity, um, but they are a little different. Uh, this is generally going to be a little bit more uh, samples than what you would see under the 360. So you want to make sure you know which program you need to sample under. Um, because if you do it under 360, you might not have enough samples to comply with the DDR10 um, criteria. But they, and then up on the top left, they also have um, things that you can reuse that soil for. So depending on what your data comes back as, uh, can you use it as unrestricted soil? Um, or, or to use it as uh, fill or undercover type material. So that there's some different parameters there uh, that you want to check out if, if you are sampling for those requirements. All right, so moving into sediment and dredging, uh, TOGS 5.1.9, that's, that's the document that, that is the go-to source for sediment uh, criteria. And what that tells you is, you know, basically when you're working under TOGS for, for dredging, um, you want to determine, one, do I need to do a sample analysis plan? Um, and that, that's determined based on your quantity of material. So the criteria here is if you're less than 1,500 cubic yards of material to be removed or the material to be dredged is greater than 90% sand or gravel. So if you do a sieve analysis or a particle size analysis and it's greater than 90% sand or gravel, then, you know, that sample analysis doesn't apply or the site was sampled in the last five years and contamination was not a concern. So a few different criteria that you can use to not have to do the sample analysis, but um, you know, it is important to involve the DC dredge team, uh, you know, the DC representatives to make sure that they agree that, that your assessment is correct and, and you shouldn't need to do sample analysis for, for your particular site. Um, when you do the sample analysis plan under dredging, that's gonna be for mainly to tell you how, how you're going to handle that material during the dredging. So there's three different classifications, A, B, and C. You know, A being more of the unrestricted, you know, everything looks good. You don't have contamination above standards and, and you can pretty much go dredge it. B and C have a little more restrictions. You get closed bucket type dredging or you have to put in other controls in order to make sure that you're not uh, affecting the surrounding um, water and surrounding environment when you do that dredging. Um, but it's important to know that that's not that that's not going to tell you how you can reuse that soil. Um, once you remove the the dredge material, um, how you reuse that that on an upland site goes back to your your Part 360 criteria, Part 375 criteria, and, and and you have to do that analysis as well to make sure you know there's not contaminants above certain levels to reuse it. All right, waste characterization, as I mentioned earlier, that part 371, those part 370 serves for hazardous waste. Um, anytime you have a waste material, if your waste soil that was contaminated, you want to do that, um, and it has to go to the landfill, you want to do this uh, uh, type of analysis to make sure it's not hazardous. Um, there's a big difference between the way you can handle hazardous waste versus non-hazardous waste. So definitely important to know uh, what you have to do. And, and, and as, as you know, all the landfills that will accept soil, they're, they're going to require the waste profile and analysis anyway. So you can't get very far uh, in that process before knowing, hey, we got to get a sample or we got to get multiple samples to, to get this characterized. And so when we're dealing with hazardous waste, we're talking about four things, four main criteria being toxicity, reactivity, um, corrosivity, and, um, and flashpoint or ignitability. So you want to make sure it's not going to spontaneously ignite. It's not going to react with, with other things in the, at the landfill or you know, water uh, reactivity or it has contaminants above a certain level. Um, so, so there are things like uh, with PCB in New York State on the federal level, uh, not a hazardous waste, but in New York State at 50 parts per million or more, it's a hazardous waste. Uh, so we'll, so Kind of depends on what where you are and, and where you're dealing with your waste material. So New York State, you should you know know all their regulations on what they have. Um, and, and then surprisingly enough, you know, you, you may think you know petroleum contaminated soil, things like that. Well, that that's got to be hazardous, right? Not in the sense of, of 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 the way the hazardous waste is characterized. Most of the times when we do petroleum spill cleanups, it does end up being non-hazardous waste, which is good. It can go to a, a regular landfill. It doesn't need to go 
uh, miles and miles away to a hazardous waste facility. Spills and tanks, that's a common thing that we do a lot of sampling for. Um, if you have a spill area, um, you know, you, you want, you got to get it remediated. You want to make sure that after you're done with remediation, everything looks good for the residual uh, soil, the soil to remain. Uh, so a lot of times we're doing post remediation cleanup set soil samples to make sure, you know, along the walls, along the floor of the excavation, everything looks good before we backfill. And it's similar on the tanks. You remove a tank, um, whether it leaked, or, you know, every time you remove an underground storage tank, you, you want to do soil samples around that excavation, whether it leaked or not. Collect some soil samples, show that that tank didn't have any impact or the impact has been has been remediated, and then you can go about closing the tank and not having uh, any further issues down the line. Similarly, with areas of concern, if there's specific areas of concern on a site, not, not necessarily a spill or or, or a tank, but you might have some equipment that, that that's there and maybe it's a high potential for um, uh, leakage or you have you know an automotive repair facility where the scrap yard, you might wanna look at those areas around those activities and see if you have any contamination issues, especially if, if you're looking at a property transaction type scenario. Uh, or, you know, if, if you've got um, some fill material that was brought in, in historically, you know, there wasn't a lot of controls on, on fill. You basically took what, whatever you could get, especially road construction, things like that. You took what you could get, you fill it. Um, and, and sometimes that, 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 a lot of times they, that had a lot of contamination in there. So, uh, not uncommon to see, uh, fill materials that, that have contaminants in them. And sometimes it's, it's things that you don't even know, you know, it might not be petroleum contamination, which is a little bit more obvious. It might be, metals or uh, pesticides. You, you really can't tell by looking at a soil um, whether it's got high metals or pesticides in it. All right, question number two. Please continue, Cheyenne. Okay, question number two is, which of the following is part of New York State solid waste regulations? The answer there is A, 6NYCRR, part 360. And we're gonna also have question number three. Please continue. Question number three, which of the following is not a fill material beneficial use classification as described in 6NYCR part 360.13? The answer there is C, unrestricted use fill. As mentioned earlier, if you're sampling under this criteria, there's really no such thing as being able to use it as unrestricted use. There are still criteria. Um, you can't use it for undeveloped sites. You can't use it for uh, agricultural land. All right. So moving out of the regulatory world and into the actual hands-on sampling and how we do different sampling, uh, sampling areas or sampling types. Um, there's, there's a variety of methods out there, equipment uh, from the basic uh, hand manual samples to different specialty equipment or equipment that's already on a site like your excavators or your, your backhoes and such. 
hand sampling this 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 is as simple as using trowels shovels hand augers sometimes we'll use a, a macro core sampler in a slide hammer uh to to drive that macro core sampler into the ground um and and these are useful and very efficient for when you when you're dealing with a surface soil sample or, or you're trying to get a shallow water sediment sample where you're not going to bring a boat or a barge in to try to sample off them I mean, you can just put on some waders go out there and, and grab your samples um, or if you're dealing with some excavated material, you have a stockpile, a small enough stockpile that you can go out easily, take a shovel or or an auger and get get a representative sample. Uh, so avoid having you know large mo demobilization events to try to get you know something that you can get right there relatively easy by by manual sampling. Obvious limitations depth wise, you just can't do as much with 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 manpower as you can with equipment. Um, so you're going to be limited in depth. Uh, sometimes you might be lucky enough to get four to six feet below ground, but a lot of times you're going to be looking at, you know, a two, two foot depth limitation on those manual samples, give or take a, you know, foot. Um, and then de decontamination of tools. Uh, you know, with the equipment and machinery, there, there's, there's some different things that, that's implemented with, with Lexane liners and such like that to limit the amount of contact, um, on, on, Equipment that you're going to reuse. Um, whereas manual sampling, if you're using a shovel, um, that shovel is getting into the sample and then you, you're going to reuse it. It's going to get into the next sample. So you do have a decontamination method in between each one of those. Um, you can look at maybe if you're like a something like a trowel, you could, if you're doing 10 samples, maybe you get 10 trowels um, and then you can uh, decontaminate later. You don't have to decontaminate between samples, but you know, there will be a, um, you know, limitation there as far as your hand sampling on, on what makes contact with your soil and sediment. Stockpile samples. If you have a small enough stockpile, usually you can do this with, with manual sampling equipment, but um, if you get into larger stockpiles, um, you just can't get a representative sample by just going to put a shovel into it, you know, 10, 20, 15 foot high stockpile. You're not going to get a great representative sample by, by a shovel. So a lot of times what, what you do want to have on hand is, is, you know, the excavation equipment to dig into that pile, get you a good representative sample. So make use of the equipment that might already be on site or, or possibly, possibly bring in an alternate piece of equipment to get you that, that good sample. Another key thing with stockpiles to, to know is, is to try to have segregation of your stockpiles. If everything's all the same, you can combine it. Great. You know, you sample it and, and all that, but, if there's distinct differences between areas, you're doing yourself a disservice if everything's all combined in one. Because if you sample, it's contaminated, you've got that whole soil mass that's now contaminated. If you've got some cleaner material, you can segregate it, you might be able to reuse that um, and not have to take it to a landfill facility. So important to, to note when a project is going on, try to segregate different types of materials. Probes and borings, uh, you see there on the bottom right, that's a truck mounted geoprobe. That's one that we use here at ATL. Um, this is very efficient means of, of getting environmental samples because it's a direct push soil sampling system. There's no auger and there's no, you know, anything like digging down casing, lock case, things like that. You can just push, push the soil samples down through, retrieve them. Uh, you've, you've got your sample there, as you see on the, on the left-hand side, that's what we're, we look at when we get a sample. Uh, that soil material is going to be contained within a, a lexane liner. We cut open that liner, and we have a, a, a re relatively undisturbed sample that, that we're able to, to grab subsamples from. We don't have to worry about, really don't have to worry much about cross-contamination issue because we're contained in that liner. So very, very useful and effective to do that. And you know, we've got other rigs and, and there's more portable rigs, uh, ATV mounted rigs where you can get into tighter spaces, smaller spaces, very useful to get around different sites and also inside buildings. Uh, the good thing with this is you can also um, get various depth ranges. Uh, these things, unless you're hitting a, a hard strata, um, you know, obviously it's not going through bedrock or anything like that. Um, but if you're dealing with sand, clay, you know, tight materials, you can usually get at least 20, 30, you know, sometimes up to 40 feet with these things. So most of the time when you're dealing with contamination, you don't have to go that deep. You're up in that upper 20 foot or so. So 
very useful for, for assessing site contamination. You could also use test pits. Um, drawbacks with using test pits is obviously you're going to disturb a larger area uh, than you would with, with those probes, but you're going to be able to see a lot more. You know, you know, obviously, you know, when we're doing probes and borings, we're, we're talking about a one to two inch hole. Uh, kind of limited on what you can see with that. Um, but your test pit, you're seeing a, a larger, a larger characterization of your strata there. Um, you can actually see, you know, get a good idea where groundwater uh, table is based on, on your test pits. And then, um, you know, if you're dealing with bin and tanks of buried debris, you can actually dig down uh, carefully and such, but you, you might be able to encounter the top of that tank and know exactly where that tank, tank might be. Whereas doing probes or borings, you gotta you gotta you gotta be wary of working around those such things. You don't want to puncture through them. Uh, other disadvantages, though, access. You know those geo probes, uh, drill rigs. You can get around the site uh, a little bit easier than you can with a larger excavator. And you know when you're digging, you can you can get pretty close to a, a building or structure with with a drill rig. Whereas an excavator, you got to be very careful about undermining that, that foundation, so you can't get as close to buildings and, and such. Subslab sampling. Uh, see in the picture here, a core drill. That's a you know typical core drill equipment. So that allows us to drill through like a concrete slab or asphalt, um, and, and then we could actually sample bring in some different equipment. You could bring like a facility like this, you can bring in that deer probe you can see in the back, bring that right forward and, and get your your sample just like you would outside. Um, so very useful in, in seeing what you might have under a building. Uh, you know, as, as you could suspect, if you have a leaking tank outside, you know, the soil beneath the building is not gonna stop it from going under the building. So you might have issues there that you wanna quantify and characterize. Um, and, and see if you need to do some sort of in-place in remediation uh, for areas under a building. Vibracore sampling, this is what we use for sediment sampling often, um, using a motorized uh, motorized uh, piece of equipment that basically vibrates your, your sampling to your sampling core right down into the sediment material. Um, allows you to get a, a good, relatively undisturbed sediment sampling. Um, Advantages can be efficiently move, maneuvered in position for sampling. Uh, you can observe different changes in the sediment strata um, and limited disturbance to the aquatic environment. There's not a lot of stuff above that sediment that's that's going on. We, we just got a barge out there or on tomb boat or something there out there and we're sampling right down directly into the, uh, the sediment. Some disadvantages is depth. Um, that can be limited based on the sediment density and equipment capability. So generally between 15 and 20 feet, uh, that's, where, that, that's where you're gonna get maximum for, for your sediment samples with the Vibacore. Um, and also when you get into tidal water, swift currents, um, you know, just trying to anchor, anchor the, the boat in position and then, you know, keeping your, 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 your vertical, verticalness of, of your sample equipment gets, gets pretty tricky. So um, that could be a challenge there. An alternative to that Vibracore is to actually use a barge sampling system where, where we might install a drill rig right directly on that barge. Um, so that gives us a little more, uh, a, a little more of a, of a rigid sampling system where we could, we could get a little bit deeper um, because we're do, actually doing borings in the sediment. Um, so we can drill down through different strata and, and get recovery. Um, and also a little bit more hardy when we're dealing with those, um, those tidal waters. Um, and faster currents. Uh, some disadvantages from the Vibracore is, you know, it, it's a more time consuming setup, uh, more extensive setup. So, um, you know, usually you can get in there with the Vibracores, get set up, get samples and, and, and move on. Um, drill rig, we're, we got cranes that we're using to, to set, set things. We're making sure that drill rig's anchored down and all that good stuff. So. Um, a lot more extensive to do it in that route. All right, question number four. <laughs> 
Please continue, Cheyenne. Okay, question number four. What is generally the maximum sampling depth achieved with a vibrocore sampling system? The answer there is B, 15 to 20 feet. All right, so last section, I just wanted to go over some special considerations of, you know, we went over the regulations, what we do for sampling, sample analysis, common containments, all that good stuff. Um, but, you know, what what are we actually confronted with when we're looking at a sample analysis project that, that that's going to make a determination on how we go about all that. Um, so whether it's the sampling plans or, you know, site conditions or, or, or cross contamination, things like that. So let's start off with, you know, sampling plans and programs. Um, you know, if it is a remediation site or it's a, it's a site that's under, you know, a, an existing site management plan or it has active activity and use limitations, you want to make sure you're, you're aware of that because uh, the sample analysis that you do might be different from the conventional, uh, you know, go to part 360 or part 375 and, and, and do it the way it describes it there. They may have specific parameters as far as what, what you need to analyze for, um, how many sample frequency, the sample frequency you need. In, in all in the types of samples you, you would collect depending on the, the work you're doing at that site. So you always want to make sure if there is something there, you're familiar with that and, and you follow that in addition to the, the re other regulatory protocol. Um, also, you know, with sediment dredging, as I mentioned before, um, whenever you go into a dredging project, you got to look at whether or not you need that sediment sample analysis plan. And if you do, make sure you're working with the DC to develop that. They'll approve it. Um, and, and then get all that up up to snuff before you go out there and, and, and just start grabbing samples. The last thing you want to do is, is have have something where you need a plan and, and you do some sampling before you have that plan, and then you got to go and resample it later on. You don't want to do the same thing twice. Um, so very important to know whether or not you need that sampling plan or if done your sampling program. Site conditions. This is gonna. Uh, be very critical for, for us when we develop sampling analysis um, or, or our sampling uh, strategy. Uh, terrain can affect, you know, things like terrain, water bodies, whether, you know, if you have trees and, you know, large tree growth, that's going to dictate how what equipment we can get on a site and how we can access it. Um, so we really need to pay attention to that and make sure, you know, at the, at, as we're scoping a project that, that we know um, what those conditions are so we can properly uh, scope what, what equipment and, and sampling methods we're going to use. Uh, you might have a concrete slab, you know, if you're in a structure, how thick is that concrete slab? Can we, is it, is it a concrete slab that we could get through with our, our drilling equipment or do we need to bring in a corn, corn machine before we, we go and, and sample that material underneath? Um, are there structures or, or foundation remnants? Did they have a, a building demolition in the past where they left the concrete on site? Uh, we don't want to go try to bringing a direct push soil sampling system and, and try to push through concrete is not going to work. So uh, we need to know that and know where we can sample around that if, if that's the case. Obviously, underground structures, utilities, you got electrical, gas, uh, storm, sewer, water. You don't want to hit any of that. So, you know, if, if we, the more information we could have on those utilities as to where their location are, the better we can define our sampling program. If, if we know there's a lot of utilities on site, but we have no clue where, where they are, it's very limited on where we can, we can select locations as far as um, doing subsurface samples. You know, so you go from underground to above ground, there's obviously some some concerns up there. If you have uh, high voltage power lines, you gotta stay a certain distance away from those. So that's gonna dictate where you can sample and what you can sample with. And then also lastly, the soil and sediment characteristics. We have a very dense material. Um, we may need to bring in a conventional drill rig as opposed to that direct push soil sampling system. If we're not going to be able to get the depths we want, we, we, we've got to look at alternatives as far as um, something that can get through that type of material. Compat compatible sampling tools. And what we mean by that is you, you look at what you're sampling for and what you're going to sample with. A very uh, you know good example of this is when you're dealing with PFAS sampling, your Teflon uh, type, you know, there's several Teflon coated trials or Teflon coated um, sampling equipment. Uh, that's not good for PFAS sampling because you can have PFAS in that Teflon. Last thing you want to do is sample something that doesn't have PFAS in it, but it comes back with PFAS because your sampling tool um, had it. Uh, we don't want to introduce that contamination. So 
You want to make sure you know what you're sampling for and you're using the right equipment for the job. Uh, implementation of appropriate methods to prevent cross-contamination. So there's various ways you can do this. Some common ways, sample from clean air contaminated areas. So if you, if you have a good idea on a site that, okay, we anticipate this area to be clean and we want to get some samples there, and then we anticipate this area might be contaminated and we want to get samples there, well, sample those clean areas first. So um, you do de decontaminate in between samples, but the, the more control you can have over how your, your equipment gets might be getting contaminated, cross contamination, the better off you can be. Uh, clean hands, dirty hands methods. This is where you, you have like a, a two person sampling crew. One's down in the trenches doing the sampling. They're the dirty hands that collecting the sample, putting it in the container. And then you have the clean hands that, you know, getting the sample after it's been wiped off relatively clean. They're doing the labeling and the processing and the packaging. So that'll help prevent, you know, cross contamination further on after the sampling has been has been completed. Uh, dedicated sampling equipment, like I said, like if you if you use a trowel, you can use multiple trowels. You can use one per sample, or if you're um, sampling the sediment, or, or with, with with the lexane liners, you use one. You use the lex. You don't reuse your lexane liners. You, you use it for one sample. You discard it. Uh, you get a new one for the next sample. So that having that dedicated sampling equipment can go a long way to prevent cross-contamination. And then the contaminating sample equipment that is reused. So you're obviously not gonna avoid, be able to every time not have equipment that doesn't need to be reused. Just the, you know, you can't use dedicated equipment for every sample. So you gotta have some, some methods for decontamination. And that's gonna be contaminant specific as well. If you're dealing with metals, you're gonna decontaminate a little differently than you're gonna deal with um, PCBs or, or petroleum related chemicals. So uh, make sure you got the right um, chemical cleaning solutions for, for your decontamination. Uh, sampling, hand, handling, and transport. Um, so there, there are definitely some critical items on that. Before you go into sampling, you want to know what you need for sample bottles and make sure they're preserved properly. Um, you know, different contaminants that, or different analysis that you're doing might need you to have a, a chemical preservative in the in the sample container to make sure it's gonna, you know, hold up until it gets to the laboratory for analysis. You wanna make sure that's all good to go. Um, as you're transporting your samples to the lab, you wanna maintain it at a, a temperature of four degrees Celsius plus or minus two. Uh, make sure it stays in, in that temperature range. So you're gonna transport with ice. Um, you're gonna keep it refrigerated until it, it's being transported or after arrives at the lab just to maintain that temperature. Um, and your chain of custody, labeling procedures, you wanna make sure everything's up to par there so um, it can be tracked properly. Uh, label the jars the same as you have on your chain of custody, that way from point A to point B to point C, everyone knows what they're getting, they know what they, you know, they know where it started, they know where it ended, and they're doing the right analysis for the sample that you've collected. And lastly, but not, Least important is your safety. Make sure, uh, you know, from, from, from the whole process, from uh, the collection of the samples to, to, to manage and process them, you wanna make sure you're safe. Uh, we use uh, PPE and protocol um, that's specific to the contaminants concerned. So make sure you know what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with PCBs, you're gonna have, a you might have a different set of PPE and protocol than when you are dealing with metals or something different. Um, also specific to the site conditions, if you're at a construction site, you know, there, there's going to be some other hazards there. Be aware of that. Where your hard hat, safety glasses, steel toe boots, and all that. You're out in the middle of nowhere. A little less hazards, but still, you know, look at what you might need for, for PPE there. Um, sampling equipment, you want to make sure you, you, you're you protected against what you're using for equipment. You could have, you know, with the drill rigs and such, you could have pinch points. You want to make sure you don't have, uh, you know, your, your, your fingers or hands in, in the areas of those pinch points. Or if you're when we're cutting open liners, we got we got sharp cutting tools. Make sure we're protected and we're using appropriate procedures to prevent cuts and things like that. And then also your work area sampling area control. Sometimes we're, we're sampling out in, in right of ways. We want to make sure we have good traffic control and we have an eye on traffic that might be heading in our direction. Or we're out again out in a construction site. Make sure that you know we've got things toned off and. Um, you know, nobody's entering the sampling area that doesn't need to be there. Uh, not only 
from our perspective, but also from their perspective. If they don't have the proper PPE on, we don't want to be exposing them to anything they shouldn't be exposed to. All right, that brings us to our last question. Sean, Cheyenne, please continue. <clears throat> okay, last question. Which of the following can help to prevent cross-contamination? Answer there is D, all above. Equipment decontamination, clean hands, dirty hands, and dedicated sample equipment. That all can help you uh, to limit or prevent cross-contamination during sampling. Well, that's all I have. I thank you guys for your attendance. If you have any questions, we'll, we'll check the chat session there and see what we have. We do have a question. Do you have much demand for sampling in stormwater facilities? Example, four bay and an infiltration basin. They're often intended to collect the first flush and therefore often contain a concentration of contaminants. Yes, we do get those requests. Um, you know, not so much. So, so we mainly went over the soil and sediment sampling stuff here, but you know, with, with stormwater, wastewater type sampling, we do, we do get those requests. Um, and, and we kind of look at it as far as, uh, you know, what can, where where the site is located relative to our offices, how can how quickly can we get to a site uh, to get that first flush sort of sample. So, I mean, if our closest office is an hour away, it doesn't do us much good, right? So, you know, if we can um, set it up where, you know, it, it's a site that we can get to within five, 10, 15 minutes, you know, we can work something out there. Um, otherwise, uh, we do have some sites that are a little bit further away where we work with with um, the owner of the site to say, okay, well, we can get you the sample bottles, we can get you some instructions on how to collect that, and, and they designate a, a facility rep to do the collection. Uh, sometimes it's just a little easier that way, make sure we're, we're in those parameters of, of that first flush or, or whatnot. Another question, have you ever encountered radioactive material? Um, we we have, I have not encountered radioactive material. I know we've had some sites where there's been concern for that. So, um, you know, we were doing other types of services on that, on those sites. So, you know, they, they gear up appropriately and all that. But on the sampling side, I haven't dealt with any of that. And uh, it, it's a unique, a niche, uh, you know, you know, you definitely want um, to have someone who, who's, who's familiar with those things and and, and and has the experience with sampling for that sort of stuff. So uh, we 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 don't really get too much involved with that. What is the best way to sample sediment behind a dam? The dam is accessed by walking. Um, we've done a, a, a lot of times with those scenarios, we've done where we've, uh, we are able to crane a, a barge or a pontoon boat or, or what, or some sort of sampling vessel to, to get behind the dam area. Um, and, and then we, we do our standard drill rig or fiber cord type sampling. Um, we've also seen, had some areas where we're able to to do it with an excavator from the bank, um, from the shore line, um, depending on how the location where we need to collect the sample. So um, a lot of times it really depends on, you know, the, the logistics of, of, of site access and, and, you know, is there a point where you can um, get a barge into um, or, or sampling vessel. And, and, and we take those on a case by case scenario. A lot of times what we do is our, our drilling operations manager, he, he goes and takes a look at these sites um, and, and says, okay, well, this is, this is, these are options that, that we might be able to do here. So, um, 
Um, I'd say on anything sampling behind a dam or something like that, we're going to look at the site and see what makes sense um, to get access to it. Uh, same vein, how about just sampling at the face of the dam crest? Is hand sampling possible? Um, yeah, again, I think it would depend on the site itself. We, we definitely don't want to go into something looking at hand sampling and put someone in harm's way. So if, if it's a scenario where we wouldn't feel safe doing something like that, we would definitely look at a different alternative. Um, and, and, and we'd have to look at it on a site site specific basis you know what what do we have what are we dealing with at that particular site and, and what equipment can we get in there um i don't know of many projects where we do hand sampling at dams with we, we try to get something more stable to work off from with equipment um just so we're not putting anyone in harm's way what about weather or seasonal changes impacting sampling Yes, that's definitely a, a thing to consider. Um, you know, when we're doing subsurface sampling, it's, it's not as big of, a, a, of an issue because we can, you know, we can use the equipment we have on hand. We can sample in the winter as, as easily as we can in the, in the summer or the spring. It's just a little bit more miserable for the personnel in the wintertime having to deal with the cold and, and things like that. Rain, you know, to, to me, I, I'd rather sample out in, in the cold and snow than sample in the rain. The rain really uh, messes things up, especially trying to keep notes and, and things like that. So, um, you know, it, it's good if you're able to pick and choose the, the nice sunny day to, to go out and sample. But um, sometimes, yeah, you know, we work year round. So uh, we, we have methods and, and such to do it in, in the colder weather and the rainy weather as well.